to to have true success is to to be free you know mm. in your creativity to to be able to work with the people that you really love um and to be respected by your peers and it doesn't mean that you have to sell millions of records because i haven't <laughs> um it just means that you get to make a living and do music and work on exciting projects and you know that's basically it i mean it's just life What's going on? Welcome to the New Music Business. I'm your host, Ari Herstand, author of How to Make It in the New Music Business, the book. Today, my guest needs no introduction, except I'm going to give her one. It is Imogen Heap. She is, of course, the artist behind the breakout song, Hide and Seek, which has been used so many times in dances and shows and movies and trailers and and remixed uh, by Jason Derulo for his song. Uh, And I've been a fan of hers since even before that time period from the Fru Fru days. And uh, the uh, famously from the the Garden State soundtrack, that Fru Fru song, you know, let go. That's her. Uh, I'm I'm a huge fan. And this was uh, just an absolute honor to have her on to uh, discuss. Actually, oddly enough, we didn't really talk about her music very much uh, or really at all, but more about uh, what she has been doing over the last 10, 15 years to make the uh, music industry more equitable and transparent and working out metadata systems through blockchain and uh, her company that she started, uh, the Creative Passport, which in the future, I'll let her explain it later on, but we'll hopefully uh, remove all the confusion when it comes to data and credits and payment and all of that. Imogen Heap, of course, she is the Grammy winner. She has collaborated with countless artists like Taylor Swift and Dead Mouse and Eric Whitaker and Jeff Beck, just to name a few. She's a Grammy winner. She has created these incredible gloves called the Mimu gloves. Uh, you should go watch her Tiny Desk performance, and she explains what these are and how they work, but Ariana Grande has used her gloves on stage, and other artists have used them. It is, um, it's kind of like the new version of the theremin, except you have these gloves, and they're hooked up to a computer, and you have tremendous flexibility when creating with these gloves on. Anyway, you're going to love this episode. Uh, I really encourage you to listen all the way through, especially to the very end when I ask her what it means to make it in the new music business. I loved her answer on this, and she is just such a brilliant mind and a wonderful person and is doing so much good in the music industry, especially the independent music community. As always, you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Ari Herstand. You can find Imogen Heap everywhere as well on Twitter, Instagram, but she talks about how she's kind of uh, not doing social media anymore, and she just has her app, which she, we discuss and get into all all about that you can find all of us that make the show at ari's take on tiktok instagram twitter and of course visit ari's take.com get on that email list that is where you're going to get the most relevant up-to-date information about the new music business get on that email list subscribe it is at ari's take.com and like and subscribe to this show. Follow the show however you're listening to this right now. Just hit that subscribe button. Hit that up thumb if you're on YouTube. Leave a comment on YouTube. Leave a five-star review on Apple Podcast. Please pause. Just go leave a review. It really helps. All right. Let's kick into the show. Imogen Heap, what's going on? Welcome to the show. Thank you. Very happy to be here. Um, yeah. Good to be here. Good to be where, here. Where are you right now? Where are you coming to me from? Um, I'm coming live and direct from Hackney in London. Hackney. Okay, yeah. very cool. Is this where you spent the last year and a half or so in quarantine and mostly plus yeah. plus? Yeah, but between here and um, my other my studio house, but um, but during lockdown I couldn't really go there, so yeah, I kind of created a little mini studio here in Hackney, which right. is good because it turns out I don't really need anything else other than what I've got. So now we're renting out the house with the studio. Oh, nice! Oh, that's, so that's great. Good. 
Cool. Yeah. Um, so what what are you working on these days? What are you up to? Every time I check in over the last 15 years with Image and Heap, it seems like you are you have your hands in something technologically fantastical that is happening. <laughs> and I'm very curious where you're at right now on this whole journey to uh, to make the music industry a bit more streamlined and, and fair for artists. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess the, the thing which is uh, worth talking about here right now, not the other thing that I'm doing personally, um, sure. <laughs> is um, around this digital identity for music makers, kind of preparing us for Web3, preparing us for all the possibilities of the new services of the new era, um, yes. where we have uh, multiple services looking out for artists um, with all the correct data intact, enabling to pay the right people 100% rather than 50% because apparently 50% mm. of royalties reach us right now. And it's a mm. very slow process and it's, it's very hard to untangle. But um, but the future is bright, we believe that, uh, for music and creativity. And we just want to empower and enable music makers right now to just start thinking about data, their own data, information about themselves and taking responsibility for that so that in the future they can go in and author, change, verify information about themselves to help other people do business with them. Is this through the Creative Passport uh, program right. that you have, you founded? Yeah, it's called the Creative Passport. It's it's very much beta mode. It does actually not very much on the tin right now, okay. um, other than just you're able to put some information about yourself and your skill sets and your projects and your inspirations and your anything that you might type anywhere about you, your biography or press image. Um, in one place to kind of mm -hmm. share with people. In fact, I should have done that with you. I should have shared my Creative Passport profile and you would have seen all this stuff about me, like all the gear that I use, all of the plugins that I like, um, all the services that I appreciate, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Is that all uh, baked into a track, I guess? So so, so uh, break it down a little bit, just uh, what you mean by kind of keeping all the data streamlined and, and all intact. Okay. What does that so mean? So essentially, um, we're trying to create a space like home for music makers, information that they control. Mm -hmm. So that say you pop up as an artist on Spotify or on Apple Music, or you've just, um, you're going on a new tour or you're about to be interviewed. Where does the information come from about you? And some of it's sourced um, from like Wikipedia, if you're lucky you've got a page um, of which you can't write your own material there. It might be an old press image that maybe has or hasn't got permission. Mm -hmm. um, it's often that it doesn't represent who you are right now. And there's a lot of missing information. So this is about creating a platform, a nonprofit platform for musicians to be able to host that information that could be useful to anyone. Um, so that when we when we are on Spotify, it might have our updated um, profile information, or it might have say, it might channel into our creative passport and have uh, you could so that a user journey on Spotify, for example, could go around and uh, find out who's inspired by who. So they'd be scraping that data from the Creative Passport and potentially paying the Creative Passport for mm. the holders themselves directly for that information that's useful to them as a product. So that's just one example. Another example could be somebody wants to see what songs have used the Neumann TLM 103 that I'm using. Mm -hmm. um, or somebody might want to know what kind of services they trust um musicians so this is a, a basically a home of all kinds of information like good knowledge that i have as a musician that other musicians might be interested in or mm -hmm. services might be interested in and they might be able yeah, willing to pay for that but all the kind of the big goal um is to essentially help the music industry not be fragmented with its information and mm -hmm. have good data and not be having multiple different um data sets around works that are all incomplete so say like one company like the PRS who distribute royalties for writers in the UK, they mm -hmm. might have some information about a song, but they might be missing some information. So they've spent maybe a couple of hundred pounds trying to like figure out who that other writer was when mm -hmm. they talk talking to some other people. And then they found that writer. But then that that is correct now in their data set, but it's not correct in ASCAP or in BMI or whatever, right. like some other. There's hundreds of them all over the planet, all these mm -hmm. collection services, and they all... Basically, every time they do that, every time they search for some information that they don't know, they that comes off the top of our royalties. Mm -hmm. So how can we stop that happening over and over again and, and help something like a data set arise? 
Yes. So there's a lot there. And, and um, I, I'm, no, no, it's great. And I want to actually dig deeper and get more uh, nuance because uh, people who are listening to this right now uh, understood everything you just said. But mm-hmm. I, I want to actually unpack that more. And because um, so there's a, a few issues with this. This has been a pet peeve of mine forever that uh, Spotify never showed who the songwriters were, or now mm-hmm. they're starting to, now they kind of do that, but they also don't show who the session musicians are, who played on the record, what mic, what gear did you use? I love all of that. I mean, that should yeah. all be there, the full credits list. Um, you know, they're slowly rolling it out. Uh, the reason that it is so fragmented and it is so broken, and the reason that Spotify and Apple and everyone else were getting sued years ago, um, at least in the States, was because um, Spotify and all the DSPs never actually required any of this information of who the publishers were, the songwriters were, from the distributors, which would have solved it from the beginning. Had they just mm-hmm. said, we're not going to put your song on our platform, uh, you know, dear distributor XYZ, mm-hmm. uh, thank you for giving us your record. We're, we want to put it up, but we can't until you tell us who's the publisher and who wrote these songs. And you need to give us that information because they have to clear that information if they're going to release it and they have to get the licenses. It was a huge um, misstep by all the DSPs that they didn't require that information from the get-go. So my, it, it's because the Spotify and all the others, these DSPs, these are the platforms that are hosting all the music and that is they're getting all the music from distributors. Why not just go to distributors and say, and Spotify and say, hey, why not Spotify make your distributors require all this information, every Mm. session musician, every publisher, all the gear. And if Spotify requires it, every distributor will do it. And then every distributor will make sure that they have that information. I'm curious why you went to kind of a third party over here instead of going direct to the DSPs. Yeah. So we have had chats, of course, with lots of people. Um, and many people go, oh, that's not my problem, that's somebody else's problem. That bit's our problem, but that bit's not our problem. So, you know, so it kind of really has to be artist driven who wear all of these hats the recording mm. engineer, they're a producer, they're a writer, they're a singer, they're a session musician, they're all these things um, in order to care about the whole self mm-hmm. of the music as a role and all the different pieces, the kind of the mother role. Um, I think also it's just once you've dealt with one distributor um, or tried to get all of the information, if that was a prerequisite, like you had to have this information, what about all those songs that didn't contain, didn't for mm. some reason have that information? Right. Then they wouldn't be on the platform. Then they still have to go and deal with the problem. Somewhere they have to go and find that information and then maybe they can't be bothered. So those songwriters from maybe long ago don't get their work up on Spotify. Mm-hmm. So the reason for doing it this way um, is we're not creating the data set of works. We are preparing our other musicians to have their, basically to be verified as the person they say they are. So that when this data set does start to arrive, which it will, it is, mm-hmm. um, different organizations and companies and uh, you know are in it to win it. And there is money in it for, um, for the people that do it correctly and properly, mm-hmm. but they can't create uh, an entire fulfilled data set without the artists going in and going actually that's not the saxophonist because I was in the room you know they're not going to be calling us up where they're going to call us they can't phone us on our mobiles they maybe they tried a twitter account I don't know how are they going right. to find us so <laughs> right. we need to we True. need to in our community you know reach out and go hey you were in that session you should you know go in and fill that data in it might even be that um I mean I I would like to think that all of the information that was true and correct that was given by whoever was giving it and it was mm-hmm. proven true should be paid for that information to you know for all the money that they've then saved everyone else for doing it so there should be some kind of bounty you know mm-hmm. for, for 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 putting good uh, data in for taking the time to get it right and mm. that then you should receive income for that. So then that would be an incentive for, say, the PRS and the writers and the publishers and the rec- recording companies to to put in good data because they're going to get cash back. Mm. Um, so you've got to create incentives and you've got to create yeah. something that's going to be easier for everyone in the long run to do the right thing. You've got to just do that. Because if mm-hmm. you try and, like... Um, say come on everyone we need to do the right thing come on let's do all this they're just going to be like no 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 you've got to make it easier and cheaper um than it is to do the wrong thing and just be like oh i'm quite happy receiving all these backhanded benefits (laughs) from the fact no one's credited correctly 
I mean, totally. And that is the reason that, at least in the States, uh, the Music Modernization Act passed and got both the DSPs on board and the publishers and the labels on board and essentially is what um, the, the Mechanical Licensing Collective, which launched in the States uh, at the top of this year, they are collecting 100% of all mechanical royalties from the DSPs, just the U.S. mechanicals. So mm-hmm. like you were talking about before with PRS, um, those listening to PRS is the performing rights organization in the U.K., in the States. Just on the P- the performance side, we have ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, but we also, uh, that's actually only, performance royalties are only 50% of all the publishing royalties that are uh, generated from streaming revenue, the other 50% are mechanical royalties. And so previously before the MLC existed in um, the States, that's where Spotify and everyone else had no idea who to pay because they're like, well, these mechanicals, unless the publisher or the songwriter comes to us and and waves their hand and said, hey, I wrote that song, please pay me, there was no way to do this. So fortunately, the MLC uh, is this body that is is looking to solve that? It is still mm-hmm. insanely fragmented, and that's you know that's only in the states, but everywhere else, like you said, yes, there's I mean almost a hundred organizations all over the world that kind of represent mm-hmm. all these rights. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Ari, that is good, yes. and the MLC is is good news that they've created that. Um, yeah. Except there's still the problem remains that if the mechanical royalties come in to the MLC and all the people that benefit from the royalties that come in from the MLC receive mm-hmm. theirs, then there's bound to be, again, 50% of those royalties, which they won't know where to send because somebody over there in Singapore didn't know that they needed to sign up and get to those. Right. Oh, actually, that's my song over there. So the of course, the like American publishers, and they're, they're all doing it because they're like, mm-hmm. yeah, we're in it to win it, and it's easy for us. And any money that doesn't get scraped up by... Um, you know, by the correct, who they're meant to be paying, will go back to them. Mm -hmm. Um, So the incentive is still twisted. You know, it's not, I don't, I don't know. I think I have no idea, but maybe after four years, you know, that's what happens with the PRS and other other companies. If you can't pay out the money, then you just keep it. So what it, yeah, with the MLC, it's three years and they actually divvy it up amongst the, uh, exactly. the people they know who to pay, which is exactly. totally fucked up. <laughs> exactly. So right. there's no incentive. And that's right. the same everywhere. So yeah. there's yeah. no reason because then, you know, even the big artists who don't need the money. Um, I've probably received money from people that mm-hmm. I, sh- I shouldn't have money because yeah. I'm, I'll am i be one of those people they know who to pay. So at the end mm-hmm. of the year, they go, OK, let's give an extra little bit to everyone else and they divide it up proportionally so you know right. the big shots get still loads of more extra money that they don't need um yes <laughs> so that's what we're trying to solve it's like how can we help music makers be aware um mm. and make it easy for people to do the right thing um if we can mm-hmm. have this kind of platform that's centralized to us mm-hmm. um each one of us so that we can go in and go you know into a data set at some point and just kind of latch latch in and go, okay, this is how you need to pay me. This is my organization. That's the point we need to get to, which we're not going to get to by November or whenever they're doing the payout. Um, mm-hmm. But that's that was definitely one of the driving forces was like, okay, this thing mm. called the MLC is going to arrive. And it's another similar, it's just the same thing. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, yes, it's one step because it's like, okay, so now people are getting paid mechanicals, but it's still the same problem um, that those people right. aren't going to get paid and the same incentive. So what are, art- what are you hoping happens with your platform or just in general with the music industry? What should we do? An artist who's listening to this right now, because it's mostly independent artists listening right now and songwriters, and they're like, all right, this sounds great. Yes, I want to make sure I get my money. I want to make sure the credits are accurate mm-hmm. and that my drummer that played on track three is credited properly and gets paid. You know, What do we do? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we're not there yet. Okay. Um, you know, we're uh, maybe a decade away from from everything okay. being like truly integrated and and ready to roll. But there are you know movements now in technology where we have the NFTs, this kind of ability to be able to put a piece of music out that's independent of any platform and be able to pay directly mm-hmm. um, a, a kind of digital artifact that's shared and kind of exchanged. Um, so there are mm-hmm. possibilities for the future. What I would imagine, um, I mean, mm-hmm. what people, why I would say people should sign up now is just be prepared like get become part of the movement of educated music makers sure. who understand the value of data and where we're trying to go help us by being part of the mm-hmm. numbers 
to um, influence change in the industry by by showing that by force of numbers, say, you know, at the moment we're like 3,000. Mm-hmm. We're a beta project and we're just doing it under my own steam sure. with uh, occasionally a bit of, of grant money. So it's, it's slow going. Sure. But already lots of people in the industry see us and believe that it's going to be a thing so they're developing with the creative mm. passport in mind as a kind of know your customer so there's lots of h- hundreds cool. of microservices that have the same problem how how do i know that that is the image in heap that she says she is how do i know sure. that another person that's saying she's imaging heap? um how do i know that uh, that that is the correct publisher you know how can we help them um deal with those issues so we want to get that right from us so we've got our house in order so mm. when the time does come, yeah. um, that you can essentially, what we want to happen is like the flow of, we want to lessen all admin, we want to take away admin basically, because we want to get on with music. So yes. you want to go into a studio <laughs> or we go to a venue or we're busking on the street or whatever we're doing and we have a creative passport. Um, maybe that's on your phone, maybe it's whatever it is, maybe it's in your wrist by then. Um, and Gosh. we'll be, um, you'll, you'll go into a space, it'll be like, ah, oh, here's Imogen Heap. I've noticed her creative passport is here. So then every single plugin that you use on your door, like in your workstation, or maybe you've done some singing, you would basically select, oh, Imogen Heap's in the house. She's here as a vocalist or as a guitarist or as a writer or whatever. And then all this information, even the very earliest ideas of a song. So even if I had a demo of a song that I'd improvise one evening, you know, during a live stream. And I have found like four bars that was like, oh, that's a brilliant thing. I, I, that's definitely going to be a song. So I might want to just store that on in a file somewhere. But imagine if that file was not just like a file that was going to get lost on my computer somewhere, um, but it was it, it went to a place that I use my creative passport to go in and author and go, this is the beginning of my idea. Mm. And then maybe I don't touch it for two years. But then later I'm like, oh, I'm going to call up that thing again because I've just met this writer who probably might want to finish that. So then you send it over to that guy or that girl or whoever, and then they maybe do a bit more writing and then it stays on the blockchain as another little piece of information. So there's a nice breadcrumb trail. And it it keeps Mm. going until it gets produced and session musicians and then maybe even management and record label and all of these things like start to like, click onto the song like Mm. extra metadata and then (laughs) then i imagine the song like at the moment we have services full of songs but i imagine that the future is songs as services so this song has all the information that you might want to know about it everything like it has interactions it has tweets about it it has like remixes it has inspired pieces of artwork it's like this massive like ball of stuff that's Mm. been inspired and all the kind of glue about what's been used in that song and then all the services around the world they have access to that and they pay for that they pay for that information um Mm. to better their service to increase like uh, engagement on the platform and then anyone who's attributed information to that song that is valuable should be paid instantly Mm. so that's what i'd like to see and and so i mean that's brilliant and i i hope we get there uh, <laughs> soon. That sounds amazing. Um, and so you mentioned the blockchain and that this is all hosted on the blockchain. Is is this built on the blockchain just because of the way the technology exists? And like you, I like how you mentioned the breadcrumbs and you can kind of see, you know, as we know, if you're tracking just like currency on the blockchain, you can see every a record, a ledger, I, I suppose, of every transaction. But that's is that similar how this works? Is that every time a, a remix is done or a new instrument gets added, that's kind of like what a transaction is on the blockchain? Yeah. Who knows? I mean, that's what okay. I think could happen. Um, I mean, there are that's definitely for the last kind of three or four years, that's what people are kind of moving towards, this, this mm. kind of uh, distributed ledger of information that I, ideally people would pull into like a, I, I kind of almost see it like a river of music mm. um, that you're just kind of plopping some stuff and then it goes downstream and then there's some things over here but it still retains all of its integrity uh, integral parts um, so yeah something like blockchain that's I mean it might be blockchain um, okay. hopefully we won't ever have to say the word again it'll just be like the internet you know um, <laughs> yes. and it'll just be like a thing that sits up underneath everything and mm-hmm. allows payment to flow uh, verification you know all, all the things that are uh, that kind of a lot of stuff is done with kind of you know companies over here and taking a bit of that and uh, yeah. um, hopefully we can just like really simplify that and allow people to do um, the fun bits you know the curation of that data there's going to be so much amazing data 
It's mm. like a kind of at the moment, all of the innovation that's really happened is around the information that's organized. And so that's with the labels. That's with like right. mass rights, um, mass recordings, uh, compositions with the publishers, like huge amounts of data. Mm-hmm. So uh, companies like Spotify can deal with that you know, because mm. they've got, okay, well, I'll work with these three major labels and then I'll go and pick some uh, independent right. stuff off and I'll work with some distributors. And it kind of, but there's no way for us, I mean, there is now Spotify for artists, but it's just kind of, it's slow. You know, we're always the last mm-hmm. one in the chain to play yes. part of the party and we're like the first ones to put anything in. So right. the way that I imagine it um, would be, I can't completely forgot what I was talking about now. <laughs> completely <laughs> forgot. Um, I had no, the way that it would, um, the way that uh, <laughs> as you go through the process, uh, the information gets added and and just how that will eventually oh, yeah, work sorry. out to be. Uh, what the, it point, is, yeah. the point was, the point yes. was, is that um, you have, yeah, all of this uh, information with the big organizations. But imagine if you had like 100 million music makers there's loads of us by the way there's like 300 million of us yeah. i mean only a hundred thousand of us actually make a full-time living out of it and i'm mm-hmm. gratefully one of those um but there's this huge curve of people who make music and dj mm-hmm. and they're doing a bit of this and working twice you know doing podcasts all kinds of things mm-hmm. um but then imagine if your data was also just as organized and as accessible or more access- way more accessible than the record label data imagine uh-huh. what kind of services could like prol- proliferate prol- proliferate <laughs> off of yeah. that yeah. Um, because then they've got all this amazing data like inspiration, gear list, projects, um, I don't know, correct lyrics, um, reasons behind songs, uh, hmm. where you wrote that song, in what cafe. You could add a whole new layer to like Google Maps or something else. You could design right. your holidays <laughs> around where songs are written. Um, wow. You could even like decide, this is my, this is actually one of the main reasons I wanted to do it, was if you, I've done like stuff for charity. So Sendai Earthquake. Um, I wrote a piece of music around the Sendai Earthquake. It's called um, Lifeline. And it was really hard for me to kind of triangulate how to get money to someone, how to get the fans to pay for the song and then for the song to pay for the charity. Mm. Um, And I just thought, wouldn't it just be so nice if I could like, you know, say another earthquake like happened somewhere. I would be like, okay, all songs or all, all royalties of Lifeline, as of today, will be going to this charity mm. so that you can immediately divert payments. Obviously, some people, if, if anyone else played on that, they'd have to agree to that, or but right. they would be able to do that because you'd just be able to fire it out across the Creative Passport. And if they didn't, they'd, they'd receive their bit. But then mm-hmm. you can imagine that radio stations around the world would choose to play songs that they knew were funding the relief of an earthquake. Um so it's that kind of like yeah. interoperability and like sharing of information, and instantaneous kind of connection with the audience that could happen if we have yeah. this kind of home space. I love that. And, and, and I mean, shout out to DistroKid, uh, the largest distributor in the world, uh, who actually has that built in. And during, um, the, the, uh, BLM, uh, movement last June and the protest, and they actually teamed up with a few of the organizations and, uh, enabled every artist if they wanted to divert a percentage of the royalties because they're Mm -hmm. a distributor, they could say, yes, 50% 50% of all these royalties from this song is going to color of change or something like that because That's they great. have payment splitting built in. Mm. It's the the platform or I guess what they have built in is payment splitting where right now I can distribute a, a song and I can designate who gets paid what percentage or yeah. anything I, and so yeah. you know splitting up the royalties but yeah that's i mean that's, that's great super great. That's just one component that's, yeah. that's super super good so though mm-hmm. each one of those like brilliant ideas of one service yes um multiplied by you know thousands of services right for the artist to decide yes i want all of my songs all around mm. the world to mm-hmm. do that thing um and great. and have the ability to do it you mentioned um NFTs earlier, and I know that you did an NFT drop, um, and you did it, uh, I believe it was April uh, through Endless, and um, it was on the Ethereum blockchain. I know you've been working on Ethereum for years. Um, I'm curious if you've been hearing, uh, if you've been getting pushback uh, on just the environmental uh, issue. Now, I know that your NFT drops, the press release says was carbon negative because <laughs> you um, donated to, you know, carbon offset organizations, stuff like that. But I'm curious why you chose Ethereum versus the other proof of uh, stake 
blockchains that don't use nearly as much and so you wouldn't actually have to do all this carbon offsetting and all of that sure sure yeah yeah i mean so yeah i've been kind of my first project was with ethereum uh mm -hmm. we just did it like a month after they launched so i do cool. have a kind of yeah a friendly feeling towards ethereum. Sure. <laughs> um the other reason was that we didn't think that we'd get the traction on the smaller um kind of mm -hmm. newer markets on the uh, you know, on Hikeknuk and things like that. We didn't mm -hmm. think that we would capture the um, the awareness of the whales, which we were hoping to get, which we didn't get in the end. <laughs> so it's all completely rubbish anyway. Um, but um, <laughs> so I suppose, yeah, I did get a lot of backlash for that. Mm -hmm. um, however, you know, the positive thing that came out of that was, I mean, it didn't feel good at the time. You know, I was like, come on, guys, you know that I'm not doing it to ruin the, the environment and that right. I think a longer term and... I know, of course, the risks, um, but yeah, we did kind of massively like buy, I think I like cancelled out all of my environmental impact as a person for a whole year with one of them. Um, so, yeah. And then the next one did the same and the same. So, and then other artists saw that and did the same. So it was just, it was an example of, you know, as you said, how it worked with DistroKid, that you could put a percentage of your NFT to an organization that you cared about. And that meant that the person buying it was also then invested and kind of understood mm. the value of how important it was to retain that. And then the next time they sell it, that will also go to that, um, mm. to that uh, organization. So I think it's a way to, it was a mechanism um, to show how, I guess in a, on a bigger space with a uh, yes, it did create kind of some negative buzz. Um, but in the long run, every single blockchain has to be green, otherwise they're going to fail. Yes. <laughs> Nobody yes. is going to if you've got like Bitcoin blockchain over here who's like you know pumping out stuff, and then you've got this really cool one over here which is like green and totally not pushing out anything bad into the environment. Then who are you going to go with? And they both right. do the same thing. You're going to go over there. So yeah. everybody, ultimately, the pressure, whether it's me or a, a company, is feeling that. And it is going to go that way. It's just, and it's always been going that way. Mm. Um, it's just time, you know. It's time you... and money and uh, and, we're, and they're very close, Ethereum. Are you talking to the Ethereum people? Because I know they've been saying they're going to move from proof of work to proof of stake for years. And I think we're all just waiting with bated breath every year when that's going to happen i feel like they just i mean i've been a little bit out of it for the last couple of months but i okay. maybe i'm wrong but i feel like they have done something kind of mm. of note uh, okay. in that direction in the last month or so i don't know exactly sorry because i've just been busy doing other stuff no worries um, no worries i'm, I'm yeah, just curious I mean, if you had a it's, it's, yeah it's their life it's their lifeblood you know they've got to get it right and there's no point if you look at the opposite, which is like the the oil dollar. Um, yes. How much worse is that? You know, so mm -hmm. nobody talks about that. It's like, oh, it's really bad. It did the NFT. I'm like, okay, but what happened about your credit card and this and that and all the things that had to make plastic and whatever, you know, and the mm -hmm. the other organisations and what do they do? And you know, it's it's just not the like plane tickets life. you buy and the the vehicles that you purchase and on and on and on. Right. I think that was just. Because NFTs exploded in the artist community earlier this year, and artists are tend to be a bit more environmentally conscious than finance people, uh, when it was mostly just uh, dealing with the commerce community pr previously, that wasn't really discussed as actively as it was when it became the artist community. Um, so that's kind of where it went that way. But yes, I'm curious, yeah. do you think NFTs are here to stay? Do you think there will always be some kind of an NFT in the future? Definitely. I hope there will. I mean, at the moment, it's like, it's not a very sexy name, is it? Non-fungible token. Right. <laughs> um, but essentially, it's like a, a piece of art um, that's exchanged between two people. And you can define the parameters of what that art is and what it does. So mm. whether it's a film or whether it's a, something you're trying to raise or, I mean, it's anything really. Um, it's just at the moment, like people are doing like little videos and little gifts and um, there's some lovely things on there, like Holly Hand and Matt Dryhurst did a really beautiful set. Um, mm. And there's some really beautiful, really, yes, yeah, so it's amaz amazing. But for me as an artist, I'm like, I feel so excited about finally having an opportunity to not think in terms of three to five minutes long songs 
um, mm. and that I could release something that's like a 20 long minute piece of music that maybe only one person really loves, you know, mm-hmm. um, but th- <laughs> it's out there and they've got it and they've supported me. Um, or maybe it's that, you know, I find it hard to go in to the studio and just finish a damn song because I've got like a million things going on and my daughter's around and you know, I just can't mm-hmm. get into the flow for long enough. Uh, but I can, you know, make a quick thing on Endless and kind of show, express my creativity in a smaller time nugget um, mm. that is still interesting and fans like it. So mm-hmm. I think it's nice to have that flexibility, nice to have that uh, box kind of broken open that you can mm. fill that uh, release however you like. And mm. that's what's exciting. But I think uh, it's kind of breaking us out of the mold and allowing musicians and artists to be freer in their concepts and uh, in their formats and um, and also being able to work, you know, cross multidisciplinary media, all kinds of yeah. things and being able to pay everyone. Yes. You know, that's the problem with you might release a video on YouTube um, and you know, you might receive a ton of money. No, you won't receive a ton of money unless you're like massive. Um, <laughs> but you'll get some money. But then what will the videographer get? You know, um, how will they be recognised? Or uh, what about your artwork that went up mm-hmm. on, you know, you got this really nice cover art that actually everyone really loves and it helps sell the music, but um, they don't get anything for that every time it's sold. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a really great kind of fun explore explore space. Um, mm. and, it, and it it feels like a playground. Yeah. And I don't know what's go- what it's going to manifest as, but I think it's going to be very positive. Um, the thing cool. which we need to uh, to do already is to, again, find a way. I mean, it's starting to, ha- it's moving very quickly. Um, mm-hmm. Like how to kind of, get, again, kind of cookie come trail back to the writer, the photographer, the whoever it was, like, so that you can go see more of their work and that they're all connected. Mm. Then there's going to be VR galleries of NFTs and the yeah. flow of kind of movement between and being able to follow artists and see their work projected in different VR spaces or, mm. you know, augment or kind of like uh, put it onto a, a wall that you're talking yeah. to somebody about and do a conference with it. And then that pays the people, you know, it's just, right, right. once it's all kind of interlaced, um, and connected and all the right information is there feeding back to the right people then we can the payment happens because Mm. now we have this technology so you have developed your own app your own platform uh with the heapster community (laughs) that you call it um and it's i think you reference it's kind of like your own version of patreon uh it's, it's a patronage where the baseline model is like two pounds a month or 20 pounds a year, or there's a sliding scale up to people can do 250 a year if they'd like. Um, and it's it's really cool. I mean, I'm, I became a member of the, the community and I was going through the app and looking at the videos and, and you're doing all these live streams and, and I guess lifting the veil a bit for this community on your process. Um, what inspired this version and what inspired you to do an app like this? Um, well, the the company originally that we did it with is a company called Superpass. Juliana Meyer, she's the CEO, and she came to one of our early um, it was called Mycelia at the time. These workshops that we were hosting all around mm-hmm. uh, London, and um, I really liked the idea of her platform. So her platform idea was to allow musicians to host all of their music in one place, and for them directly to receive music on their own app that would also pay rights holders. Um, and you could put demos up there, you could chat to your fans, um, you know, and that seemed like a fantastic idea. The problem was that then when she tried to get the licenses off, you know, Sony, um, they were like, yeah, yeah, sure, you can you can have them for 10 grand a year. And she's like, Gosh. what? You know, I was like, excuse me, they're my song, can you just give them to her, please? And then you'll receive yeah. money on the payment of the plays. And I realised that that's what's happening in every single music service. They ask this upfront money. It makes Mm -hmm. it impossible to create these new business models. Mm. Um, And then we're stuck with these big companies um, with the tiny, you know, royalties that we have. Because major music companies like to receive money upfront that they don't have to give to the artist because it's not under the same remit. Uh, it's not in the contract. So that's what happened with Spotify and everyone. They, kind of, they had a piece of that, uh, of the pie. 
And it happened with YouTube. It happened with Facebook. It's essentially yeah. bribes for them to go away, which is yeah. infuriating, especially when like, you know, they, they sue Facebook because a lot of these songs are on their platform. And then Facebook's like, here's a hundred million dollars. Can you just go away and we'll figure it out? We promise. And they're like, all right, this works for us. And of course the labels and the publishers keep that money. They don't pass it along to their artists. Yeah. And, but yeah. now they have the rights to use it, which mm -hmm. is kind of crazy. I think there have been people like, um, you know, Taylor Swift, who'd kind of pressured labels like Universal to, to divvy up some of those payments and mm -hmm. have been effective. And so, you know, artists can sometimes move the needle in the right direction. Yes. Um, but yeah, it's it just really upset me, the whole thing. Um, so we we basically did pay, I think, the 10 grand in the beginning. And then, uh, well, I probably shouldn't say this in public, but now we just basically put it up there and I don't care. Um, right. So there's like, because <laughs> there's only like, right. there's like 300 fans or whatever. And it's like, what yeah. are you going to do? Um, so yeah. we put all of my entire catalog up there, all the demos. And really the idea was, there was no place to do that online anymore. I used to have mm. um, a website back in the day, like 25 years ago, um, or 20 years ago, where fans would go and it, it was very like a kind of community vibe. There was no like speak to the masses and everybody can chip in. It was just very close, nice, you know, real fans chatting. And I would talk about my process and, mm. and that's how I made my records. Um, but then you know, the Twitter came along and I was, I was excited about it. I was like, oh, this is cool. I can like give more, you know, about my creative process. And they mm -hmm. featured me on Twitter, which is where I've got a lot of followers that I probably shouldn't have because they were just like, oh, okay, who's that person? I'll follow that <laughs> when it, when it started. Sure. Um, and then, but then it got too big and then I couldn't, I couldn't reach people. Um, mm. And the same with Instagram and everywhere. It's just like too many people. I can't really talk to anyone meaningfully. So then I went back to the app during lockdown because I, all my team were on furlough, um, you know, supported to some degree by the government. And, um, and I was kind of like on my own, just going, shit, you know, how am I going to pay for that stuff? How am I going to keep the creative passport going? How am I going to, I had all these things and I had so much work to do mm. without my team. Mm. And I just thought I need to, we, I need to, I need to get back in touch with those guys, like the fans. I need to, I need to be there. I, I need to talk about my process. I need to talk this through with somebody. Um, so yeah, I just reached out to them. We we basically already had the app, but I started to to talk more and I did these blogs and and then just through chatting with them on Discord, um, they kind of encouraged me to just put everything up. You're like, oh, I've mm. I've found the little version of this song. You don't know, I've got it, but I have got it. Can I put it up on the app? So actually, my fans. Um, are, are they are putting all this stuff up that I didn't know was out there, but it is oh, out wow. there. Um, and they're just putting it up. I'm like, fine, just do it. I don't care. I'm cool. fine now. We're all in bed. Um, yeah. And it's really freeing. It's like, it's mm. really just so nice to just be like, what's it all? That's mm -hmm. who I am. That's who I was when I was 14. That's who I was when I was drunk doing that thing. That's who I was. <laughs> you know. And they just don't care. They're happy just to know yeah. you and to and to be on a level with you. And it's really freeing for me to just to just to let it all hang out, basically. Mm. Um, so, yeah, we have these That's amazing so sessions. Sorry, I'll just tell you because it's really lovely. Yo, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Every Thursday, actually, it's not every mm. Thursday now because I've changed dates with Scout. Anyway, yeah. um, every Wednesday or Saturday, I chat in this chair, which is like an egg chair, and it's got like a tablet in it and a little um, camera, microphone, speakers and um a little band for my heart rate and basically i that my my fans have a way to kind of go there's this bot okay it doesn't sound very sexy right now it's a chat bot and it's called yeah. a imaging augmented imaging and the idea was how can i basically come off social media which i have pretty much um and i just went into my app and, I've, and it's been so lovely um every now and then i tweet something but very rarely and um, so I was like, but how can I still like be in touch with that world? Because I don't really want to, I don't want to be answering the same questions again, like Imogen, when are you going to come on tour? Or Imogen, uh, what's this song about? Or, Imogen, da, 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 whatever it is. And I was just like, so I just basically had to stop the noise um, and go small, go, go back with the ones who really wanted to talk about stuff with me. Mm. Um, and who really, the, 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 I had, you know, the real, the core fan base. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a 24-7 world and you still might discover something, you know, on Twitter or whatever that 
you actually do want to follow up with. So I was like, how can we build um, an AI that could in time field these incoming messages um, and also for the, for the creative passport? So it's like Imogen, blah, 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 asking me a question. And because I sometimes do feel like a bot, I'm like, I don't know, or <laughs> I wrote this song about it, or I'll just copy and paste that, you know. Right. So why not just be like truthful about it and and they can have the answer from a Imogen. Um, hmm. not. Um, but if they do ask me something that's not been asked before, then they get to talk to me in the chair. Um, and then we have these discussions like you and I are, and we talk about everything. We talk about my sex life or my lack of it. Well, actually, my just recently uh, revived sex life, which is wonderful. Um, <laughs> so, no, so good. Um, uh, or it could be about, you know, my sister's death, or it could be hmm. about whatever it is, or it could just be something funny. Um, and, oh, actually, one of my fans, this is amazing, um, diagnosed me with, I've got this thing called Hashimoto's, which I didn't know I had, but I was basically talking in the chair. It's like an over, an underactive thyroid, but it basically shows up as a bit of a goiter, so you can't see it really, but there's like a little growth there on my neck. And um, this, this fan called Di noticed that I had a slightly enlarged thyroid, and she was like, you need to go to the doctor because I think you've got a goiter and I was like where oh so I went to the doctor I had a goiter and I got it Whoa. diagnosed and I have Hashimoto's which is the same as my mum which explains my lack of sex drive my depression my anxiety my overweightness over the last six years since childbirth so wow. the te- this chair is like this incredible like it feels like a massive hug you know that people mm. are looking out for, my fans are looking out for me we're having these discussions it's like therapy so actually the <laughs> the app started out by just kind of okay let's put lots of stuff on there and it's worked mm-hmm. out as literally this kind of pulled me through the lockdown pulled me through horrible like everyone had um and also like helps me with my health and my sex life because they just recommended yeah. <laughs> they recommended a dating app <laughs> and I've now met this great guy uh, well anyway it's not oh, I shouldn't talk about it um don't want to jinx it so um <laughs> it's like really random but the listening chair is called the listening chair and it's it, the acronym TLC is also tender loving care so oh, yes. I feel like that's what I want my AI to be you know to to kind of mm. help me navigate my life um help me know and kind of discover things that are really going to excite me as a person as a as an artist um mm. and to have my tools to hand so as a, an accomplice really um and in time maybe we'll make music together um or and in time maybe my AI will go off and like sit on other AIs or people that I really respect that they're learning and, and how they've trained their AIs. Um, so we're slowly, slowly t- together doing these workshops, doing these uh, sessions in the chair. We create these Q and A's and then the fans go in and edit them to bite-sized chunks that augmented imaging can then have in her knowledge store. And then oh, wow. somebody else asks me the same question, it will be there. So it's like this really lovely wow. cycle. Um, and in fact, in the future, I'm going to start taking all of my interviews in the chair. So then you uh, would also be contributing to a Imogen. Ooh, uh, nice. So part. are you training your uh, AI uh, in a musical realm as well? Or in the future, is the augmented Imogen going to uh, write and compose and create your music and uh, while you're playing with your, your kid? With me. With, with me. You. Yeah. Oh, okay. With you. Definitely. Hi. Yeah, yeah. Without shadow, without. <laughs> Yeah. So your, your co-writing create, partner um, will be your AI. <laughs> one of them, yeah. I wow. mean, if I'm extremely busy and mm-hmm. I need to get a song to a certain point and I can I can like type in a few parameters, it's trained off entirely off my music. And, you know, I have my go-to chords. I have my go-to inversions. I have my go-to structures. But equally, mm-hmm. you know, once it gets to that point, it could... Um, it could equally help me get out of my patterns. So I could be like, hey, hey, Imogen, uh, could you like just throw me a complete curveball? Like what's the least type of music that I've ever written? Could wow. you just throw me up some chords? And I'd be like, and that would then help me rediscover an entirely new way to write that I would then adopt into myself. Mm. So it's like, it's not about kind of carbon copying what I do. It's, I think it's about like upping the game of creativity by highlighting your patterns and helping you get out of them that's what i'd love to happen mm. um and that maybe you know we're on stage together and a imogen i don't i don't feel like i want to anthropomorphize her like i want her to or a, a they i don't know um mm. what this person this thing will choose mm-hmm. in the future um but you know it might be that 
instead, so say my, my emotional contextual information that comes in from the camera, maybe that might end up becoming different colors. So uh, maybe there's like a kind of color language that emerges. Um, so when you, you see the, or you hear the voice replying to you uh, as you've just spoken to it with your camera and you're exchanging discussions with A Imogen. Um, a Imogen might like go from different colors and you're like, oh, that's when she's slightly nervous. Or, oh, okay, she's, I can tell she fancies me or whatever it might be. Um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but you kind of visualize that. Um, and you want and, this? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, um, yeah, absolutely. And yeah. then, uh, but then, so, so people kind of, I imagine that, um, I don't know, but what I think right now is that A Imogen will take on a, a persona, like an aesthetic persona, which could be, I don't think it's going to be a person that won't look like me, but um, mm -hmm. maybe maybe she'll be, a, there'll be a cityscape, you know. So mm. maybe if I'm in the city, cool. if I'm in London, A Imogen might take on the character of a city and the lights that come on might be how in, how excited I am by the conversation. Or they might just all go out when I'm like bored. Um, <laughs> or wait, wait, Imogen's just bored and then someone's like, delete A Imogen. Um, <laughs> I don't know. But um, yeah. it's very exciting. And then you, you know, take it into the VR world um, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. you know, how you can it, exist a, as a human and the AI um, visually in that space and kind of create together and how other people can then go in and like touch a image and, you know, and kind of pull bits out and with the music and, you know, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> but it's very exciting. And it's, uh, but it's early days, it's basically a chatbot right now. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. But crazy that's cool i mean i i you know i think in the songwriter community we're like the ais are coming for our compositions they're gonna eventually write all the songs in the no. future but i like how you look at this as more of a collaboration and an augmentation um of of you and your artistry and and i like that it, it you can only uh, she or they will challenge you in the future to yeah. uh, actually become more creative. That's that's yeah. cool. I I haven't seen it uh, displayed or illustrated like you just did in such a positive light before. But everything, it's everything been scary. that we use, that like say if we go mm -hmm. and use a drum machine, it's kind of like it would just use a drum machine. It's made us do a cool beat that we would never normally do because we just yeah. don't know how to play the drums. Um, right. So that's already like, it's an early version. It is that. It's like an extension of that. And we're quite happy to do that. And we know that it ups our game. Like, oh yeah, that fat beat. So we're going to go off right. and do this thing that we wouldn't normally do because we're just not quite that cool yet. But it's helped yeah. us be cool. So we've got this <laughs> cool beat that. to do. Yeah. I love it. So And, and the other thing I think is that, yeah. um, just like, this is maybe a bad example, but... Um, GM food. So like in England, you have to have like a message on your packaging that says whether it's GM modified or not. Uh -huh. um, so you could have a similar thing, like a kind of code that like in France, you have to put um, if a photo or an image has been photoshopped, you have to say this image has been photoshopped. So huh. it could be the same with music or art or generative art. You could, you could, you could have a kind of percentage or some kind of like, you know, you don't even really look at it, but you just go, okay, you glance it and you understand, okay, this is 90% AI generated or it's like, 90% human generated or 100% mm. and then people could like search music depending on the variance of like how much percentage of what and what <laughs> people might only choose uh AI generated music for maybe because it, it you know it, it deals with fast-paced 3D virtual yeah. animatic stuff better than a human would which I'm sure it would um but then the human in the loop um which mm. is a term I learned the other day um would then mm. go in and tweak that and make it you know uh, kind of put, put it in into the environment of the human and is going to be watching it not an ai mm. um well maybe also an ai who knows ai right. in, in <laughs> um <laughs> so it's like you look yeah, at the nutritional information on the back of a face you're gonna similarly yeah. what's the breakdown what's the makeup of yeah. this thing yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and then i think cool. there's no threat because as long as you're you know transparent with what you're selling and what you're what you're receiving um mm -hmm. i think it's important and i think mm. that that then yeah, I think if we had that, people maybe be less threatened. Amazing, amazing. Imogen, I have so many other questions, but I'm not, I don't have time to get to them today. This has been uh, mind blowing, illuminating and, and really incredible. And uh, I, we didn't even get a chance to, to talk about your, your Mimu gloves, but I encourage everybody. I was watching the tiny desk performance where you explained it. And I thought that was brilliant. And it's so cool to see that those are taken off and used by Ariana Grande and, and other artists experiment with them. And so um, congratulations on everything that you've done. I love the just, 
I just love where you have taken uh, your career and it's it's as an artist in the industry, I think all of us are very appreciative of what you've done to give back to the artist community and how you are working and using your platform and just and 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 your resources and your know-how and your brilliance to help push us in this direction that we need to be going uh, in terms of um, equity and fairness and getting everybody the credit and the payment they deserve. So thank you for yeah. all of that from oh. all of us. That's very kind, Derry. I feel very nice now. Of course. Very, very kind. Thanks so Good. much. Good. <laughs> um, I have one final question that I ask everybody who comes on the show, yeah. and that is, uh, what does it mean to you to make it in the new music business? In the new music business? Um, in the new music business, I would say um, to, to have the freedom to do exactly as you please. <laughs> like not to feel restricted, not to feel like, oh, I have to go that route because that's the way that other people make success, have to do that. To, to have true success is to, to be free, you know, mm. in your creativity, to, to be able to work with the people that you really love um, and to be respected by your peers and it doesn't mean that you have to sell millions of records because I haven't. <laughs> um, it just means that you get to make a living and do music and work on exciting projects. And, you know, that's basically it. I mean, it's just life. It doesn't mm. have to be, you know, you make a number one. That's for a certain type of like character that I mm -hmm. could never do. I could never do that thing of like keeping that up. Um, never been interested in it either. Uh, just very much want to yeah, be true to my creativity and feel free as an artist to explore and grow and experiment and be supported by my friends and family and fans, which I am. And Yay. it's great. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Imogen Heath, thank you so much. This is great. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Take care. <laughs>